You're listening to The Real Talk Real Estate Show with your host, Clayton Hepler. Today's guest is Brian Burke, the Midas Touch real estate investor. His real estate experience extends from acquiring over $400 million in real estate and owning more than 700 single family homes. But his accomplishment doesn't stop there. Between raising over $100 million from investors to writing his own software to manage his portfolio of single family homes, Brian Burke has made a real impact on the real estate industry in his career of 30 plus years. So please help me in welcoming the man who put all of his high school paychecks at 16 for getting a private pilot license, Brian Burke. Hey, Brian, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Please tell our listeners a little bit, you know, your career has spanned uh, a few a few decades Uh, But tell us a little bit about how you got into real estate and kind of what you're currently focusing on in your um, acquisitions. Well, I I got into real estate when I was really young because I I saw this book on investing in real estate and kind of figured that, you know, hey, this this has to be a great way to make money, you know, so uh, I thought I'd I'd give it a shot. You know, I, I had nothing going for me. I mean, I didn't know anybody in real estate. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any connections. I didn't have any knowledge. So, you know, I pretty much had everything I needed to have a successful career in real estate, right? So, you know, that I just grew it from there, man. The rest is history. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I will, you know, going through back to all your podcasts and, and learning more about you, uh, you have been in a few different niches in real estate and you hear from a lot of gurus that say, oh my gosh, like focus on just doing one thing and doing it well. And you've been able to successfully replicate, um, in various niches, um, your real estate success. I'd love to hear about you. You've talked before about how your your first plan was to buy a couple of houses, um, and one house a year, one rental at a time, and just save for retirement. What was that mindset shift into getting into kind of bigger properties? And the theme of the show is is a lot of multifamily. So I'd love to get into kind of what you're doing currently as well. Well, maybe it's like an addiction, right? And as soon as you, uh, you know, you you, uh, you have the first one, then you got to have another one and then another one, and then you just keep going. The next thing you know, you're overwhelmed. And I think that's kind of how it went. My, I really did set a goal for myself at one point that I thought if I could buy one property a year and put it into a rental portfolio, I'd, I would be able to retire in a much better position than anyone I'd ever known. And And I set out to do that. And I quickly realized that uh, I didn't have the money to buy one property a year. So, you know, what? if I could buy one, I had to sell it quickly. And so, you know, I was buying and fixing up and reselling as fast as I could because, you know, that was the only way I could, you know, kind of make money and keep it, keep it going and keep it growing. Uh, and I did get to the point where I could actually like, you know, buy one, flip one, buy one, keep one, buy one, flip one, you know, and then, and, you know, and just keep a, a, a little bit here and there and, then that got me into the point where I had, I had a few rentals and I sold a couple of them and did a 1031 exchange, my first 1031 exchange. And I bought a 16 unit apartment building and that was how I got into multifamily. And, uh, you know, it was really just kind of a, uh, you know, a component of my natural growth cycle in, in real estate and thought that uh, it made more sense to forget about buying a house a year and, you know, maybe just buy them in, in uh, multiple units at once. Mm -hmm. So you've said in in a past interview, the best way to grow your business is to uh, grow it organically. And in our current economic climate, you know, we have extremely low interest rates and in, in, you know, in the real estate industry, you know, money's a, a lot cheaper in terms of raising it right now. And I think it's important for our listeners, Brian, a lot of our listeners are kind of learning the fundamentals and they're starting their journey. In our current economic climate, can you speak to a little bit about um, how to grow, how to grow kind of your business organically? Would you say, hey, go in, jump in and get a 20 unit, 50 unit, as all these gurus are saying? 
how, how can we take that advice and maybe insert it into what we're kind of going with now when everyone's well, there? Yeah. Well, let's start with taking the guru advice into context. Um, you know, if, if I was selling a course that teaches you how to buy a 20 unit building, uh, I would be obligated to tell you that the best way to start is to buy 20 unit buildings. So, you know, take that advice into context from someone that's built a business from absolutely nothing. I mean, literally nothing to one where, you know, I bought a half a billion dollars in real estate. Uh, that's not how it's done. Uh, if you want to start with a 20 unit building, chances are greater than not uh, that you'll be met with tons of obstacles, resistance, and things that make it nearly impossible for you to execute. You'll get frustrated and you'll give up. I mean, that's if the statistics bear that out. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, if, if a guru tells uh, 10,000 people to start in 20 unit buildings, there's probably five or six of them that are actually going to make it and will go up on stage and say, this is definitely the right move and that's how I should have done it. But the, uh, ni the other 4,994 of them that quit and gave up, you'll never hear from them. So uh, take it from me, Organ organic growth means you do whatever it is you have the capacity to do. Mm. If that means that you can only buy a mobile home, go buy a mobile home. If it means that all you can do is a single family house, go buy a single family house. If it means that you can buy a fourplex because you have enough resources that you can do that, go do that. Certainly start at the highest level that you're capable of starting with, with the resources that you have available to you. Uh, and then you grow from there. So, you know, I, I did houses and then I did, I bought a couple of duplexes and then, you know, I bought my 16 unit. And then from there I bought a, an 11 unit, which seems like it's going backwards, but it's really, you know, that was an out of stater. So now I've bought multi-units in another state and then it's, you know, then my next one was 60 units and then it was 54 and then it was 136 and then 200. And, you know, it, it just grows and grows organically over time. And if you try to force it or push it, uh, you could end up short circuiting. That's yeah, that's a great point. It, 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 I'd love to learn or, you know, hear from you. Uh, what, how do we or maybe just take us through your mental models, how we can, you know, it, whether it's a new investor, he's learning or she's learning about it, getting into it. Is there a way that you were able to effectively kind of gauge what your comfort level is? Because there's a big part about us saying like, you know, you get an analysis paralysis as a lot of newbies do. Um, and they don't, they are like, Oh, I just want to buy this like super small property instead of saying I have the capacity within myself to go to do this. It, but I, I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm going to subscribe to that advice. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Analysis paralysis is a really easy trap to fall into. And I fell into it. I mean, for years I studied, you know, I, when I, when I was uh, growing this business in and flipping homes, I was buying properties at the courthouse steps in foreclosure auctions. And I literally studied every foreclosure auction for four years I, I watched what, you know, how the house went into foreclosure. I watched who bought it. I watched what they did with it. I watched what they sold it for. And, you know, and really a lot of that was very educational and it, I needed to do that in my own mind to prevent myself from making mistakes because it's a very high risk business. At least that, that component of real estate is a very high risk business, but it was probably a lot longer than I needed to spend in analysis paralysis. And I think I was stuck there for a while. Uh, when you're doing income real estate, it's really easy to get mired up in spreadsheets and you know never want to come out of them and just analyze numbers and never actually do a deal because after a while it becomes comfortable. Um, but growth doesn't come with comfort. You know, any kid growing up can tell you their bones hurt when they're growing, right? And it's like, uh, there, there are just growing pains. And you know, I found that the more uncomfortable I was, the more I knew I was heading in the right direction. So, you know, if you're staying awake at night because you're worried about something, you're probably stepping in the right direction. Okay. So it's, it sounds like it's a balance between the analysis paralysis and making sure that, you know, you have the adequate resources and knowledge, but you're still putting it, you're not mistaking movement for action. That's um, right. 
So um, the, I, I want to go into your career because everyone in real estate um, wants to know how do I how do I continue to have successes? You know, you you want to focus on getting that first deal, but how you can continue to have successes? There there are plenty of really successful real estate investors, but you see a lot of them now have been successful from 2012 to now. Um, and they haven't ri ri rode those kind of, you know, market cycles. What's your unfair advantage as a real estate investor? Well, the true path to success is failure. And that's literally how I was able to grow is, you know, you have to leverage your failures. And when you get stuck in, um, in an adverse situation, that's when your mind really starts to think, how am I going to get out of this? So, you know, I've survived several market cycles, including the worst market cycle of all, which was the Great Recession that, you know, took place from about 2006 and finally came out of it around 2011. Uh, that was a very painful uh, time. The initial years of that was a very painful time. And when you're having a lot of uncomfortable conversations around the dinner table about why things are, are not going so well, <laughs> Uh, it really causes your brain to think, uh, what am I going to do to not only get out of this, but to also make this a success? And you just have to think creatively. And, you know, when you're comfortable, your mind doesn't think creatively because everything's working fine. You don't, you know, branch out and find new ways to grow. Uh, but when you're stuck uh, between a rock and a hard place, you get really creative. And so, your failures will make you a lot stronger than any success will ever make you. So your what, what, your unfair advantage would be able would be to to make it through those types of you know persistence. Uh, what would you say? Maybe drill down a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think my my unfair advantage is that I've been through it, and you know having having survived and having kind of seen what it looks like, uh, you know. Now when adversity comes up, I recognize it, you know, you know, I see it right away because I've been through it before. I don't have any false, uh, false vision about what a recession looks like. I see a lot of people commenting like, oh, well, you know, you should invest in class C apartments because, you know, everybody has to have a place to live. And, you know, those are going to be the last ones to, to empty out because, you know, every, everybody will go to the, what they can afford. And, you know, I'm here to tell you that's BS. You know, the ones that, that actually performed the best were the Class A properties. You know, I, I not only owned Class C, but I saw other Class Cs. And, you know, what happens is, is that the, the higher tiers start dropping price and they, they cannibalize all the good residents from the lower tiers, leaving only the worst residents to remain there. And so, you know, I, I know what these cycles look like and, you know, I know what they do. So now... It's an enormous unfair advantage, I guess you could call it, uh, that uh, you know, I know what it looks like, I know what to look for, and I know how to survive it. And that only comes from having lived it. You can't read about it in a book, you can't take a class on it, you gotta experience it for yourself. That, that is a momentous, like, I've never heard that. And everyone says now that you know, Class C is, it's, it, it, you know, everyone's gonna need a place to live in, and that, that is kind of like what all these gurus are talking about when they, you know, pitch their courses. <laughs> um, let, let me ask you on the same vein, what do you con kind of conventional wisdom that you've in your experience seen as, you know, been bad for new and upcoming investors to, to have. It, 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 and I say that, you know, someone, for example, I had an experience with wholesaling, and I wholesaled a couple of properties and everyone's like, you know, you could do wholesaling from your living room and just, you know, call, call people and you're not going to have to worry about anything. And you soon find out your, your car is putting more miles on it than you would ever think you're driving around neighborhoods. You're learning about what other things you see is problematic. And maybe we can, maybe we can focus on the multifamily. Niche. Oh man. It's, um, uh... It's a tough business, you know, and everybody wants to tell you how easy it is. And generally they want to tell you it's easy because they're going to teach you how to do it for a fee. Uh, so I, you know, I think that's one of the things that you have to keep in mind. And, you know, wholesaling is, 
is, is often touted as the uh, easiest entry point into a real estate investing career because you can literally do wholesaling without any of your own money. Uh, you don't even have to close on a deal. All you have to do is get something in contract and flip it to an investor. The part of that story that's left out is that that's extraordinarily difficult. Uh, I mean, first of all, it's difficult to get a property in contract at all, but to get one in contract with any discount uh, or at least a large enough discount that's going to interest a buyer is enormously difficult, especially for someone just getting started. And then you've got to figure out how much is the place really worth and you're brand new. What do you know? I, you know, how do you know what it's really worth when you're brand new? So, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of that kind of, there's a lot of those obstacles that make it challenging to, to get started. And, and, you know, and multifamily is no different. Uh, you know, you see a lot of people out there saying, you know, send out postcards and, you know, and mailers and all these other kinds of things to try to get principal to principal multifamily transactions. And it's, uh, it, it's really worse than a needle in a haystack. It's really like trying to find a needle in a stack of needles uh, because no one, that owns a 200 unit apartment complex is paying any attention at all to your postcard or letter. They're all going in the trash before it even gets to their level by, by their staff. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the obstacles and, and kind of like things that no one wants to talk about is that uh, multifamily deals happen through brokers and, you know, people want to try to find ways around that and uh, it doesn't work. Mm, another another gold nugget right there. So, what do you see as the 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 top wastes of time for a new investor? Because you know you hear all these things. Oh, you know what you can do? You can um, send LinkedIn messages. You find out, or you know whatever the crazy thing is, um, or postcards to two hundred and fifty unit apartment investors or who have a conglomeration of thousands of units. What are the top three wastes of time for a new investor? Uh, the top, the top wastes of time are trying to trying to jump too high. And you know, if you imagine like you're standing on the ground, you need to jump on top of a roof. Uh, you know, you can crouch down and you know lunge up as fast as you can with as much force as you can to try to jump up on top of that roof, and you're probably not going to get very high. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there's a ladder there and you climb that ladder one rung at a time, you can probably get onto that roof. So I think what a lot of people waste time doing is trying to jump on the roof instead of trying to climb on the roof. Ooh. And so, you know, the difference is, is, you know, it's like, if I just, I just told you a minute ago that buying multifamily happens through brokers, right? And so then people will say, okay, the solution to large multifamily is you build a relationship with a broker and, you know, you take them to lunch or give them football tickets or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, a little story they have about how you build a relationship with a broker. But the truth is that the relationship with a broker only happens one way and that's to close a deal. And now you say, well, how do you close a deal if you can't get one and how they're not going to give you one if you haven't closed one. So you're kind of in this catch 22 and it really comes to like, okay, you bought a house. Now you go and you buy a duplex and you say like, you know, Hey, I can buy this duplex cause I have experience buying a house. Then you buy a fourplex because you've got experience with a duplex. Then you go to a 10 unit because you've got experience with a fourplex. Then you go to the commercial broker and you say, Hey, I've got 10 units. I got two duplexes. I got two fourplexes. It's time for me to make the next step. I want to buy a, a 50 unit. And you know, they're going to listen to you more because you've been proven that you can acquire. And you're not just there to waste their time. And their, their time is very valuable and very busy with phone calls from all kinds of people saying, I want to buy a 200 unit apartment complex. Well, who are you? No one. Uh, so step up that ladder one rung at a time. You'll earn their respect by showing them what you've done, not by telling them about what you want to do. I love that. How do you build a relationship with a broker? Close a deal. <laughs> That's that. And so <laughs> along that same line, um, what are the, what are the kind of higher impact activities? You know, you hear people are saying, Hey, you know, go on a blog, start a podcast, do these things. Very valuable. Um, but, but what are the kind of Brian Burke highest impact activities that you've found have been successful in your career? 
Well, it depends on what side of the fence you're talking about. So, you know, real estate kind of has two sides of this business, right? You know, one side is buying real estate. The other side is raising money to use to buy that real estate. Now, a lot of people approach this business as a real estate business. Um, what they find out, or maybe they don't find out, but you know, what I learned a long time ago <laughs> is that this is not a real estate business at all. This is a financial services business. Uh, you know, my competitor is not Joe Blow real estate investor. My competitor is, you know, JP Morgan, Chase Bank, or Wells Fargo, or TD Ameritrade, or E-Trade, or, you know, any of these other, uh, you know, anybody that's doing mutual funds, you know, Transamerica, whatever. You know, these, these are our, our competitors because they're providing investment options for their investors. And that's what we do. We provide investment options for our investors by finding a way to achieve a return for them in an alternative fashion that isn't uh, stocks or bonds or life insurance or any of those other things. We use real estate to do that. So, you know, first step is, is recognizing that this is not a real estate business. This is a financial business. Once you've done that, you know, then you can raise money. But you know, the, what I found to be the most highest impact in raising money is just, it's, I've never done a podcast. I've been guests on 50 podcasts probably, but I've never done a podcast of my own. I don't have a blog that I'm out there, you know, like promoting. I'm not on social media and LinkedIn and throwing stuff out there constantly all the time. Uh, you know, I do participate on a website called biggerpockets.com. Uh, which is like a social media website for real estate investors. And, and I got started on that site for one reason and one reason only. And that was, I thought I could help people out by answering some questions if they were stuck. And I went on that site and I started finding questions and I started answering them. And oddly enough, what happens when you have intelligent answers to people's questions is you get noticed. And, and as a result, people started noticing that, you know, I, uh, I either knew what I was doing or at least can sound like it. And uh, they, you know, started uh, calling and asking if they could invest with me and um, have me on their podcasts or, uh, or present at their conference or whatever. So I think the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that has been the, the largest value add to my business is first, recognizing what this business really is. And second, just getting yourself out there where people can discover you and find out that you actually know that and know what you're doing. I think that this brings me to um, a concept that uh, I think is overlooked often in the real estate business, and it's career capital. It's having actual value to give in exchange for you taking someone else's time. You can start a blog, you can start a podcast, but if it's not actually adding value to anything and you don't have that experience, then it's hard um, to even be noticed um, and right. prove it. I mean, you, I, I, most of the, the biggest multifamily owners, as you see, they don't have blogs. Blackstone doesn't have a blog. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they, have, they have success and they have career capital. And I think right. that, that you're, you're pointing out um, that, that you know, you're, your competition is not the next syndicator. Your competition is the trillions of dollars that is that are in retirement accounts and you say, Hey, consider another, consider another investment approach and getting on bigger pockets. I, I love that. Um, so tell us a little bit about your multifamily business, kind of where you're acquiring, um, what type of assets you're acquiring, um, currently in this, uh, in this economic client. Yeah. So, you know, we're buying, uh, class B mostly, uh, value add multifamily. We're actually now starting to transition into a little bit of a product, uh, multifamily properties. They have to have some kind of value add story. I mean, we need to have some way that we can go in and improve the income stream at the property, whether that's through management changes or physical improvements or preferably both. Uh, our typical property is 150 to 500 units, uh, you know, somewhere in that, you know, call it, 15 to 25 million dollar price point generally uh you know we just uh, this year we've closed on a thousand units that we've acquired uh 
one of them was uh, a little over 500 units on a two property portfolio, then another one that was 421 units, which just closed a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, our, our portfolio is up a little over uh, 3,000 units uh, and, and growing. Uh, next year, uh, 2020, we'll sell 1,000 units. So we're kind of in this cycle now where it's hard to grow much because, you know, you buy 1,000 and you sell 1,000 and you haven't grown at all. <laughs> so if we're going to add 1,000 units to our portfolio next year, we have to buy 2,000 units. And, you know, we, we have a large footprint, though. You know, we're, we're uh, buying, you know, in... We're all over from Arizona, uh, Las Vegas, Texas, uh, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina. You know, we're in a number of different markets. The important thing for us is that every market that we buy in is a top MSA that has above average job growth, income growth, and population growth. And those are the three drivers of multifamily fundamentals. And, you know, we look for all three of those in, in any market that we're going to buy in. We're not secondary or tertiary market players, we, we look in uh, more primary markets. Excellent. So you have a little over uh, those, the 30,000 units with, okay, job income and population growth is, is what you're looking for. You, you said in the past that you bootstrapped a lot of, a lot of kind of where you are and how you got and you like we alluded to earlier, you, you grew organically. Do you have a set of principles that you kind of govern your investing, um, your investing criteria by? And it's not investing in the income, the population, um, or looking at MSAs. Is there anything that you, that within your company culture and, or within your personal culture that is uh, your governing principles? Well, I, I think, um, you know, most importantly, we want to be in newer assets. So, you know, pretty much we're only looking at stuff that's built after 1980. Um, we want to be in primary top markets, uh, generally top 50 MSAs. Uh, you know, we want to be able to add value and increase the income stream. And we want to be able to deliver to our investors. And, you know, we've been very fortunate that in the 30 years I've been in this business, I've never lost any investor principle. So, you know, if I had any one guiding uh, light in this business, it's that my job first and foremost is not to lose anyone's money. My second job is to make the money. So by focusing on quality assets in quality areas, uh, we can deliver on, on that main guiding principle. So I'd like to move into uh, kind of a, a deeper dive or, or, or more fire round type of thing. Um, before we jump into that, though, you, you, you're talking about these class A assets and in, in, it goes against a lot of what people are preaching um, now. You know, find, check out those secondary markets. Everything is overpopulated. There are too many investors in this and you're buying a thousand units. Um, why do real estate investors, particularly multifamily investors, why do people fail in this business? Uh, I think generally they, they fail because of either inexperience or uh, faulty, uh, faulty underwriting and faulty assumptions. And, you know, there's, a, there's an, uh, a line of thinking that this is kind of easy, that it's just simple math and that, you know, if you can run some numbers, you can be successful. They forget that this is still a people business. And, you know, there's residents that you have to convince them to pay their rent. Uh, you have to convince them to live in your property. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a real human element and component to that. Uh, and, you know, from both the property management side, the capital management side, and the investment side, uh, there's a lot of nuances that will sneak up and bite you. And, you know, it takes, uh, it takes experience and living through it to recognize those and, and avoid them. And I think uh, a lot of people, you know, just are overconfident that those things won't come up and bite them. Uh, and they haven't planned accordingly. And it, uh, it comes up and bites them and uh, takes them down. So let's jump into the uh, real talk real estate uh, fire round. Um, what are 
what are some of your limiting beliefs and, and how have you, or maybe in the past and how have you kind of gotten over them? Um, geez, limiting beliefs, huh? <laughs> guess, you don't, guess, guess you don't have any. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking to a guy that was uh, working in a grocery store when he was in high school and thought, I, you know, I could go learn to fly an airplane. So I took my, uh, my paycheck every week and I used my weekly paycheck for one flying lesson. And that was where all my money went throughout high school. Uh, I think most people's limiting beliefs would have said that, you know, no 16 year old kid bagging groceries can become a pilot. Um, and I managed to pull that off. And I, I think that, uh, that right there, uh, it just does not allow me to have limiting beliefs. Uh, I think that anything is possible if you set your mind to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's my, my biggest limiting factor is that uh, I don't, <laughs> I feel like I don't have anyone. I probably really do. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. So uh, what drives you to keep investing and how can we learn from it? Uh, I, well, what drives me is I enjoy what I do. And, you know, I, I'm able to provide an investment return for my investors. And that gives me a lot of satisfaction uh, to be able to help them achieve their objectives. And I just don't see myself doing anything else. So I guess, you know, what drives me staying doing what I'm doing now is, you know, I don't want to go back to work in, you know, being a, a police officer or a firefighter or a grocery checker, which are all things that I've done. Uh, you know, I, I kind of look at it like, what else would I do with my life but invest in real estate? So uh, I just keep doing it because that's that's just who I am. What was your biggest challenge in real estate, and how have you learned from it? My biggest challenge was probably, you know, everybody asks like, what was your worst deal, right? And you know, I think that's probably my worst deal was probably my biggest challenge. You know, I had uh, uh, right after the uh, real estate market collapsed in what 2006 it started collapsing 2007 it was in full swing by 2008 you know kind of the worst of it was behind us <clears throat> so I thought you know what it's time for me to get into large multifamily and you know and expand my you know my multifamily side of my business and you know so I, I bought this property and I paid half of what the last guy paid for it and I thought you know, this is the perfect recipe. It's what everybody talks about in all the guru classes. What I failed to recognize is that even though the real estate collapse had kind of already happened, the economic collapse was uh, still in our future. So I started adding value to this property and I got it from like 70% occupied to like 99% occupied where it stayed for like a day. <laughs> and then, you know, the whole economy unwound and, you know, the, the Great Recession was in full effect. And it really had a huge impact on this property and, you know, wasn't making enough money to service the debt and all the expenses anymore. So, you know, I, I had to figure out, you know, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to make it so that I don't lose my investors money on a property where, you know, it's barely paying its own expenses, but won't even pay for the loan payment. So my solution was I dug into my own pocket and started making the loan payment myself. And it was like 15 grand a month. I did this for like four years. I made this loan payment out of my own pocket so I could save my investors from having to take a loss. And finally, when, I, when the recession kind of worked through and everything and the market started coming back and, you know, eventually the occupancy came back and the income came back and ended up selling the property and even making a profit, if you can believe it. And it was like all that I had to go through to survive that challenge was like my greatest challenge and my greatest lesson. And, uh, you know, I guess challenges and lessons are kind of one and the same, huh? Wow. Yeah. Um, that is 15,000 bucks a month out of your pocket. Ouch. Three. Right. Ouch. Yeah. Tell me about Were it. You married at that time. I was, I've, I've been, <laughs> I've been, I've been married for, uh, about 30 years and, uh, it, yeah, it's very uncomfortable conversations at the dinner table. I can assure you. It's like, why are we, taking everything we have and dumping it into a loser. And uh, the reality of it is, is that in this business, your reputation is absolutely everything. 
if I've missed payments or had a foreclosure or an investor loss, any of those three things, I would have been finished, or at least I would have had a really steep climb on the other side to try to get back into this business and had a big black mark, and it would have been enormously difficult. In retrospect, had I not done what I did, I would not be anywhere close to where I am today. Uh, you know, that, that experience has been a major driver of our growth, believe it or not. And uh, it's, uh, it's just kind of one of those things that, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you're not really sure why you're doing it. Maybe you think that the good Lord is guiding your steps. Uh, as When you get through it, you look back on it you realize that's exactly what was happening and it was just meant to be that way. And that was a lesson I was meant to learn and it was a, an experience I was meant to, to go through. And now that was leveraged to, uh, you know, make me what I am today. Wow. Um, have you ever been to a guru course? I actually have. Uh, I attended a few different courses, uh, kind of midway through my real estate career. Uh, which I thought was kind of interesting, you know, uh, everybody bags on gurus like, oh, you know, it's a big you know, waste of time or it's a lot of money and it's rip off and all these other kinds of things that you hear. But the way I used it was I had a decent fundamental knowledge. And if I could go in there and spend 2,500 bucks or, you know, 3,500 bucks or whatever it was to sit in a boot camp for two, three, four, five days, and I could come out of the other side of that boot camp with one or two like real legitimate nuggets of information, uh, then that was, I could probably make back 10 times over uh, what I paid in tuition to get there. I think the biggest problem with guru camps is people set the wrong expectation. They think I can go from knowing absolutely nothing to knowing absolutely everything in five days for, you know, 2,500 bucks. And it doesn't work that way. Uh, so uh, I, I, I like the way I did it better. Go in the middle of your career, not in the beginning. That's a great, I love, I love that. So what, what's your number one real estate book? Do you have any book that you look to, um, and you know, in, in a career like yours, you might not be able to point to one book, but is there any book maybe that you would recommend, um, our readers to, to check out or listeners? Well, you know, I, uh, I don't read many books. I haven't read books in a long time, but uh, I just don't have the time. Uh, but you know, there is, there is a really good book. If, if you're looking to be a, a multifamily syndication sponsor, there is a really good book out there uh, called It's a Whole, New, uh, a Whole New Business from Gene Trowbridge. And it's a, it's a great you know, kind of legal aspects of syndication book. So I, I like that book. I guess now I have to say my favorite book is the one I just wrote. Uh, and that, that one will be out uh, sometime early in the spring. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really written for passive investors, um, not for syndication sponsors. But I think syndication sponsors will get a lot out of it because they'll learn a little bit about what investors are looking for and what they're looking to not find. Okay. I've never, I've never even heard of um, this whole new um, business. Um, and also that book, I'm really excited to, to actually pick that up in the spring and we'll update the show notes, uh, it's at whenever it comes out so that you can get, you know, some, some people on this cause you've provided so much value. So what's your real talk, uh, best mindset tip? Maybe, I mean, maybe you don't have a mindset tip. Maybe you're just like, I'm just going to go fly a plane or do whatever. <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. You know, I've, I've been asked this kind of thing before and it's kind of like, I've never had a good answer for it because, you know, I don't really look at, you know, anything I do as like a specific mindset. I just look at like, Hey, I'm just dedicated to doing what I do because I love it. And so I show up every day and, you know, I give it my all and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always working towards my goal and to make it the best that it is. So, you know, my mindset, I think is just, you know, be there and stand and deliver. And along the same uh, vein as that, uh, what's your real talk best habit uh, that has kept you successful in, in these, in these couple of decades that you've been in the business? Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like just along that last answer. My my best habit is really, you know, I'm I'm in the office every day, and you know, I work at it every day, and I'm always spending time 
uh, on it. And, you know, I, I try to have a good work life balance, but, um, but really, uh, to grow a business like this takes an enormous amount of effort and I'm very committed to it. So I guess my, my biggest habit is just being a workaholic, <laughs> at least to some extent. Uh, that's something I have to try to make sure I keep contained as best as possible. Wow. Brian, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I can say that this was like me attending my own uh, seminar. I've gotten so many nuggets out of this. And- <laughs> And I hope our I hope our reader or our listeners have as well. Um, is there anything else? That w- w- how can our you know listeners get in touch with you? Most of them are in the, the midwestern market, um, maybe to invest, uh, learn more about uh, partnering with you, or or just getting in contact with you. Well, the best way is through our website, which is praxcap.com. It's p r a x c a p dot com. Uh, that's the best way. There's links to our social media channels on the bottom of the, uh, of the webpage. Not that I'm really all that big on social media, but I guess we have to say that or we're like still in the 20th century. And I guess I'm old and I still probably am in the 20th century. Um, but that's probably the best way. Also through biggerpockets.com. You know, I, I like to participate on that website and answer people's questions. I'm active on the forums and Uh, can often be found uh, there uh, answering people's questions. So you never know, you might post a question on the forum and get an answer from me, who knows. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. Thanks for having me on, I really appreciate it.